welcome me and welcome me. Thank you. I forgot to record. Cool. Um, join me in welcoming Rachel. Hi, Rachel. Hi. All right. Cool. So I'm going to introduce our next person, and then once I read their bio, I'll pin them and we'll go straight to it. The next person I want to introduce is Abu Kamara. And Abu, am I pronouncing your name right? Okay, cool. All right. So originally from Dakar, Senegal in West Africa, Abu has a background in engineering and leadership. <clears throat> Excuse me. After completing a Bachelor of Science in Electrical Engineering at the University of Tennessee, he started his professional career at Adenso, Maryville, Tennessee, a global automotive component manufacturer headquarters in the Japan and the part of the Toyota Group. And later, while studying, while working full-time at Denso, he went on to earn a Master of Science in Industrial Engineering with a concentration in engineering management to further refine his skills and knowledge. Currently, he is the, is the Senior Manager of Manufacturing and Engineering in the Surface Mount Device Division, where he continues to make significant contributions to the company's success and ensure that all aspects of manufacturing and engineering run smoothly and efficiently. Hi, Abu, welcome again. We're glad to have you. All right, so the next person I'm going to introduce is Helene. All right, Helene, how would you pronounce your last name? Uh, Huang. Huang. Thank you. Okay, cool, thank you. So um, Dr. Helene Huang is the Director of Asia Programs at the Center for International and Intercultural Studies at St. Lawrence University. She received an MA from Harvard Divinity School in 2012 and PhD in Education from the University of Tennessee, Knoxville. Dr. Huang is, also serves as the board member for Pearl Institute at NYU. She is the founding leader of the Asia Internship Programs at St. Lawrence University. He was also the advisor of Pro Project Bengyu, a nonprofit organization that sought to build a global community of young ambassadors to strengthen the US-China relationship. Ms. Huang is also a leadership training expert. She has led teams to lead and teach leadership education at Peking University and the University of Tokyo, and joined as a coach for leadership training at Harvard Law School Business School and School of Education. Dr. Huang Dr. served as the managing editor for International Education Journal from 2008 to 2010. Hi, Helen. Thank you. All right. So um, last but certainly not least is Infanyi Chuku Won Sisi. This one I can pronounce well because it's from my country. Um, so Infanyi Chuku is currently a senior finance manager at Microsoft Responsible for leading efforts in building networking cloud infrastructures and inventory management. He has held other finance roles at AWS and Intel, supporting the provisioning of cloud capacity and data center products costs respectively. Prior to that, he has worked in operations and engineering as an NMPI, NPI program management and Tulian engineer. Outside of work, he enjoys playing soccer catching up on the latest TV shows or enjoying time with his wife and two kids. You are welcome. All right, okay, so, uh, perfect. So welcome again, welcome everybody. And for those that are just joining us, you are welcome. Like I said, I'm going to start with questions for our panelists. And if you have questions, please reach out to myself or Heather in the chat and just put your questions there so we can read it out. But I'm gonna start with questions um, that I've prepared for them. And so this question will be for everybody. And I know I just read out your bio. I just read all of these amazing things that you all do, but would like to hear from you. Can you tell us about your background and how you started your professional journey? Tell us about your background and how you started your professional journey. Let's start with Kelly. Helen, you can go ahead and answer. Oh, 
So yes. you're gonna start with me. Okay, great. Yes. Yes, thank you. I thought you're gonna start with Heather. I'm sorry. I didn't realize that Heather is at the back end. Well, first of all, Bucky, thank you so much. And Rachel, thank you so much for the opportunity inviting me. It is such an honor that you know we kind of reconnected with my uh, UT community. I miss everything in the spring. Um, I miss the flowers. I was just mentioning this to Bucky and Rachel. But um speaking about the uh career, you know, my professional journey, um, I was just checking the questions Bucky sent out to us, and I think I I saw Sort of can connect my the second question um sort of a, uh, related with my um experience at ut about uh rachel that was 15 years ago right 2007 then uh, there were many things i realized that i did um at ut as well as my later um time in, at harvard all connected together and uh, contribute to me as an international educator um so i was just writing down some of the notes that i did at ut because uh bucky was mentioning about i was uh, uh served as the uh, managing editor for international education journal that was actually when i was a phd student here uh, with dr barbara thayer bacon while well, she retired um anyway so uh, i think that was a great opportunity for me to learn about international education from academic Academic perspective. But I also appreciate the fact that uh, UT is a such place that I, I remember there were a whole bunch of volunteer opportunity, internship opportunity for us to delve into the real world to get our hands dirty. So this is something that I, you know, I read through the questions that I think very important is that go do something that you're really interested in. Don't care about what you're going to get back. I mean, at that moment, I mean, the long run, it's all going to contribute to your career. But thinking back, um, uh, back when I was a PhD student, one of our professor, Allison Anders organized all of us to be a volunteer at the Bridge International. Um, it's an NGO that helps local refugee camp students to learn English. Um, this is something that I did. And then Rachel organized with other uh, local uh, Chinese or Asia community for the Chinese New Year. I was lucky to be selected as a singer. And then uh, um, I was a teaching uh, assistant at the uh, Modern Foreign Language Department. Um, I was a TA for three years and I got a chance to meet with a lot of undergraduate program students. And uh, Richard, if you remember, we organized a couple, you know, events, including donation to one of the students who was suffering from cancer. Um, so I, I would like to say that all of these uh, things, it, it seemed like very small uh, back when I was a student, but it all contributes to my professional journey that I come to understand why international education is so important to me and to people around me. Um, and uh, since Bucky has already mentioned about it, that um, I received my PhD here at UT in education. And also I receive a master's degree of uh, divinity, I mean, MTS, theological studies at Harvard Divinity School. But I would say my professional journey actually started when I was a PhD student here. And then uh, at Harvard, I did a couple of different things that um, I, I work with a uh, I worked with a professor um, who is a community engagement um, I would say leader who uh, helped Obama to uh, win his uh, 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 let's say election back in 2008. And I was lucky to work with him on leadership training. So um, that was very hard at the very beginning because, you know, Asia type of leadership is completely different from the US type of leadership. Uh, but anyway, so that's a lot of uh, workshops I participated in. I later become the first uh, Asia uh, teaching fellow for the professor. And then uh, I started to work on many different workshops and I get to know people. I listen to their stories and understand their background. And that actually can contributes to my understanding of how to be an educator. Um, sorry, I spoke too much, but it's just a little bit of my experience at UT and also at Harvard that helps me to be a, um, let's say, professional in international education. Thank you. Yeah, that's awesome. Thank you so much for sharing that. I really like that. Um, Abu, we'll go to you next. And the question again is, can you tell us your background and how you started your professional journey? Yeah, I wish you want. Yeah, I think you're muted. All right. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. All right. Uh, thank you for inviting me. Uh, I know I've been very busy with stuff, but I'm glad that I made it. I really like this type of panel, you know, as an international student. So as, as you mentioned earlier, I'm originally from Dakar, Senegal. So I started, uh, actually, I first came to US uh, with my uh, some of my family members and we were at Ohio. So from there, I think I came here during the summer, was going to Atlanta and we stopped by Tennessee. And the funny thing is, 
on, we were on the hill in downtown. So I kind of see the whole, whole orange town. I'm like, man, this is kind of different. So definitely kind of end up at UT. Uh, actually, before that, I went to the Institute of Language. That's where I study a little bit, maybe one semester, just kind of to understand what's going on around. Then uh, joined the uh, engineering department uh, where I graduated. And after, before I actually, one year before graduation, I was looking for a summer job and I ended up getting hired by uh, Denso Manufacturing. So that's my first time coming to Denso. So I work here during the summer and uh, seeing an opportunity for internship was offered to me. So I took it. And since then, I've been at Denso for several, several years. Uh, so just in summary, uh, that's how I started. I started in the engineering department as a regular engineer uh, and end up in leadership, uh, participated in several projects, you know, travel all around the world. And I think uh, based on that, I learned a lot. I mean, met a lot of people and learned a lot. That's very much how I started my career at Denzel. Yeah. Uh, I so keep much. it short. I'm a little different, but I <laughs> save some time for you. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Thank you so much, Abu. Thank you. Appreciate that. Um, all right. If I, uh, back to you, what would you say? Uh, how do you start your professional journey? Yeah. Um, so I'm originally from Nigeria. Um, so I moved here for school and I came here to study like mechanical engineering. So I did that. And um, so how I actually started was that I did mechanical engineering and then did a couple of internships um, at Nissan because I did my undergrad at um, um, University, Tennessee Tech University, all the way in Cookville somewhere. Um, I did and uh, worked with Nissan, did my internship, um, got called back, you know, worked as a tooling engineer for a bit. And what happened was that after working in engineering, you know, I started thinking, you know, I wanted to pivot my career into more of like into like more, more management and outside of engineering so that led me to do my MBA at UTK yeah so that's how I got into University of Tennessee and then once I did my MBA it opened a lot of doors for me across several um, parts of different organizations so I've moved around a little bit and that's what led me um, to become a financial controller right now at Microsoft so oh, yes. Thank you. yes thank you so much all right Rachel yeah, um, well, thank you so much for having me, everyone. And I echo what uh, Dr. Juan and everyone has been saying is that um, uh, I think it's very important as when I started my professional career, I really started by trying different things. I got my undergraduate degree in journalism, international journalism, when I was in Beijing, one of the most renowned communication universities in China. Um, and I, right after that, um, actually during my pursuit of my degree, I started a internship and part-time job with the Associate Press TV News, and that's a news agency. So a lot of footages and things that you see here in the United States is actually transmitted back by the AP, um, the Associate Press TV News. So I cover, at the time, I cover a lot of different beats, beats meaning different fields of uh, stories, different type of stories, and I learned about the journalism field. That was what my undergrad degree was, but I wanted to try out the profession before really committing to this is gonna be my lifelong career. And after trying that, I noticed that uh, there were some challenging moments like irregular working hours um, and also frustrations about you know doing journalism in different types in different countries and just the regulations around it. And then I realized that, well, maybe that's not where my career pursuit ends. So I started looking at with an undergraduate journalism degree, what else can I do? Decided to come to the United States to pursue a master and PhD degree to get into research. Um, so during my PhD years, I did the teaching assistantship and talk to a lot of professors about, you know, what is it like to be a professor at a university? Because a lot of times, you know, with a PhD degree in this field, you are expected to either pursue academic or research career. And then I realized that maybe that's not where my passion lies either. <laughs> but fortunately, during the, that time, I was also uh, working as a GA for, um, as a GA recruiter and in a communications role for the Ag Campus. That was when I was introduced to the concept of international education, recruiting students and doing all that. And that actually led to my first job with the chemistry department at UT. And I was a science communicator, writing stories, still very much related to what I was trained for, writing science stories and 
recruiting students and dipped, uh, kind of dipped into mm -hmm. the uh, fundraising alumni engagement as well. So that kind of paved the way for my next couple of roles. I served in that position for about seven and a half years before moving on to become the um, assistant to the chancellor. So I served three different chancellors here at UT, was able, had the privilege of viewing the operations of a university on a higher level. So knowing day-to-day -day operations, budgets, and being able to sit on all the cabinet meetings, knowing how the decisions are made, what's important when running a huge R1 research one institution like UT is. And that gave me the vantage point of knowing, well, all of these in the education are the different areas that I can explore. Then that opportunity came up, which is when my current boss, the vice provost for international affairs, Dr. Gretchen Leisler was hired back in 2018. And we started chatting and she was asking me where my background is, what my passion is. And we decided, we, we just felt this instant connection that I can do more, contributing more to the university by serving in the current role, which is more about building global partnerships and also utilizing my communications background to do the marketing and branding for the university. So that's how I ended uh, where I am now. But still, I think I have a curious mind, as everybody here, I'm sure that you are as well at this stage of your life, is I say curious. I'm still looking at different areas um, and um, just try my hands on different things like real estate and going and reading something like Wild Dreams, uh, influencers on the social media, and I'm not really afraid of trying things. So I would say that I start off by exploring um, and really prototyping of all my professional um, jobs and then see if I really like it, if I want to do it for the long run. So yeah, this is my journey. All right, thank you so much. Uh, can anyone hear me? Still? Yeah. Okay, cool. Okay. And is it just me or is? I think, I think, Bucky, we, we cannot hear you. Rachel, I can hear you. Okay, so Heather, do you, uh, do you think maybe the internet, Bucky's internet has some problem? Yeah, I think it might be Bucky's internet. Um, let me see. Wait on her end. Yeah, she just left the call, so I'm assuming she'll be right back. Um, but if we want to pick up with, um, yeah, she just messaged me. Give me just one second. Sorry for the technical difficulties. Yeah, I think the second question was, how was life for you at UT as an international student? Um, and I would just volunteer stepping as a moderator for a second. Uh <laughs> yeah. Um, whoever would like to answer that, with these computers restarting. So if you just want to keep going and I'll let her in when it's time. Thank you all so much. Um, so I, I will start. Um, my life at UT as international students was a, it was a very uh, rewarding experience. I am not a shy person and I'm very extroverted. So like what Dr. Huang was mentioning that we did a lot of things together. We're in the same cohort. So we, we did a lot of things together involved in the student organizations and trying to do new things almost every day, every week, um, probably kept us ourselves too busy. But that's also a time where we build a very strong network of all the friends. And there are now lifelong friends working in different professions. Um, so that was very beneficial. Another thing that we did, or I did uh, as well, is to be very actively engaged in local community as well. So not only in the international community, but also volunteer at a lot of different nonprofits and got to know a lot of local connections. I think that really helped me in terms of expanding my network locally um, and securing where I am right now today. Um, then I will toss it over to uh, 
Helen, do you want to? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, don't forget, Rachel is the best anchor in our Chinese New Year event, and I believe in any many other events. So it's uh, uh, Bookie, don't worry. Yeah, we have uh, a, a, a good uh, anchor here, so you can join us later. I'm just kidding. <laughs> Anyways, so uh, my life at UT, um, I was just laughing and uh, laughing when uh, Rachel was talking about it. Um, I would say yes, thinking back. Well, PhD life, um, I don't think that's easy for anyone. But still thinking back, I think that was good because uh, it was really good. Uh, part of the reason, as Rachel said, is that we involve um, get your hands dirty. That's that's the uh, one of my rule of thumb uh, in my life that I always wanted to meet with people to learn from them. Um, uh, and it's, it's, there are so many interesting people in this world and just, just be quiet and listen to their stories, chat with them. And then uh, one thing that I think we also like to go to church uh, as well and try different food. Uh, and also that's a great opportunity for me to learn about religion. And that's why it leads me to Harvard Divinity School. Um, Cause while well, back then I was uh, in the process thinking about what religion I would um, uh, you know, follow to. But as uh, Rachel said, it's really important that uh, we keep meeting with people, connected with the community, try new different projects, and also, you know, get to know people. I think the most important is that I hear different stories, and I enjoy it so much. Yep, that's my life at UT. Thank Rachel. you. Yeah. You want to share? Yeah, I'll just go next. Um, my life at YouTube was great. I had a really good time. You know, one thing I remember is, you know, connecting with people from different backgrounds. I made really lifelong friends here. That I still keep in contact with you today. So I enjoyed every part of it. Faculty was great. I actually like Knoxville as a city in general. <laughs> Unfortunately, I didn't have to stay there. I'm all the way in Seattle now, but um, I really enjoyed my time there. And, you know, I would just encourage people to join like different student groups you know, the African Student Association is a good one as well. Um, so yeah, overall, I, it was a good experience for me. Thank you. Abu? Uh, yes, my, my my case was a little different. Actually, uh, before I, uh, I have never been around international student, to be honest. I mean, a bunch of, you know, Black American, you know, Africans, that's what I know. I mean, my family, half of them were born here, so we're always having back and forth. So my first time exposure to different countries outside of this region was uh, at UT. So I think I met people from almost that class that year. We had different nationality in there. So I was the one that wanted to, I'm curious, I wanted to try all kinds of food. I wanted to go to every kind of party or cultural event. So I really, that was where my biggest learning experience started. Uh, that's what actually pushed me to love to travel Asia, Europe, everywhere. So that was uh, my first step of learning what's going on around the world and very interesting. I didn't know what was going on around the world. I was in my own bubble, but that was uh, very interesting. Thank you. I think that UT was really just a great environment to, to push us out of our comfort zone, get to know more people. And I'll definitely say that for those who haven't been involved in the activities going on in the international house, that's where one of my, like my home away from home. So I do encourage, and then that's really a place where both international and domestic students, we, we hang out a lot and we still have free coffee every day over there. Um, so let's go to the next question. Um, it was asking what were some of the things that you got involved as a student that prepared you for your professional career? I think every one of us sort of already touched upon that already, but may I just say that if there's one thing that you feel like that made a huge difference for you in your mm -hmm. professional career, if you can only say one thing, what would that be? Yeah. Well, uh, great question, Rachel. I'm just going to jump in. One thing is that I, I volunteer opportunities. Um, it can be in conference. Um, actually, my career started with uh, NGO, and well, it's even based at Harvard. Um, well, I have to say Bridge International back then was based at UT. It's a volunteer opportunity. You know, at back then, you probably don't see that as a lot of benefit. Oh, you're going to see a lot of famous people. No, you're just working with, uh, you know, people on the ground. But it's very helpful for you to accumulate experience. At the same time, you will meet with people in the field. Um, I noticed there were some questions relating in the international education. There were so many volunteer opportunities that you can participate, and that will help you build connections, network, and your experience. So thank you, Rachel. I would say volunteer opportunities. Thank you, Helen. Yeah, yeah I can relate with that. Um, for me, it was a couple of many things, right? So. 
would say be part of different associations. Like I was a very active member for National Blacks um, MBA um, or National Society of Black Engineers. And, you know, any opportunity you get to lead a team, um, lead, right? To give you leadership experience, you know, those associations, they have a lot of professional um, rooms where you can learn how to speak publicly or, you know, build your resume seminars that really help you. So I think, um, you know, join some of those associations and it did really help my career overall. Thank you. All right. Yes, for me, actually, I was lucky to get an internship very early on. I think I just stumbled to an internship, worked for the summer, they asked me to stay. So um, two years before I graduated, I started doing it. So based on that internship, that's where I really prepare myself and understand how the real life, work life, you know, how it is. Because when you're in school, you don't understand those things. You're just studying. But that's what I really were able to understand what's happening on the on the ground so that's uh, my first my most uh, experience as a student in the professional life and i would say there's very distinctive uh distinct experience that i remember was i challenged myself for one week i call that week just say yes week so that week if you ask me anything as long as it's not against the law or <laughs> you know like the just the general good sense of what is a good human being is, and I would say yes. So that was the thing that I did. And a couple of things that come along that week I remember was I was involved in a video project where we did an Asian awareness video, and I was linked to the local arts community since then. And then I also said yes to a um, communications role on the board for the local A1 arts community. So then I was involved in the first Friday arts community. So that that did um, help me to kind of uh, enlarge the network that I would otherwise not have an opportunity to get to know. But um, I'm not advocating to say that, you know, everybody just to say yes to everything. But I will have to say that um, in college, those are the years that I feel like I'm fearless and also I don't have anything to lose. And I have a very high level of risk tolerance because I know that I can explore this path. If it doesn't work out, I have the time, I have the opportunity to do other things. So that was my experience at UT was my just say yes week. <laughs> I think like I benefited a lot from that. Um, and that actually leads to the next question. So we all experienced a lot of different things when we were in college, but how did you navigate through all of these different opportunities and figuring out what you wanted to do after school? Anybody feel to, feel free to jump in. Yeah, I think I can go first, right? So uh, looking back, I, I would consider myself that I was a good engineer, but I wasn't a great engineer, right? And I figured that early on. So. While I was working as an engineer and I found myself um, diving into other things within the company to drive efficiencies. And um, I noticed that I was getting more recognition for stuff I was working on that were not really engineeringly related, right? So that was kind of like a light bulb moment for me. It was like, what am I being recognized for? What are people giving me credit for? What am I actually really good at, right? Now, not taken away from my engineering experience, that was really great. You know, I learned a lot of you know, analytical skills, you know, um, how to, you know, find solutions. But after those moments, I began to realize that probably I'm better off not being an engineer, right? So that's what made me pivot into those areas. You know, it's it's never, I didn't know honestly exactly what I was going to do. I actually thought I wanted to work in automotive for the rest of my career. That's what I thought. But when I started doing it, I started realizing that there are other opportunities around. You know, I started getting involved in more things, learning more about how organization works. And that's how I found myself in finance and I've been loving it ever since. Not saying that, you know, if there's opportunity that doesn't happen in the future to get into, but right now, this is where I want to be and this is where I've been for a while now. That was very interesting. It just reminds me that I was reading a data the other day that only 25% of the people who are being surveyed to say that they work in the field where they were trained or getting their degree from. So it's very likely that you're working the field that you didn't get a degree from. But. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I can jump in. Oh, um, okay. oh, sorry, go ahead. No, go right ahead, I'll yeah. wait. <laughs> Thank you. 
Yeah, so, well, I was just thinking from a social science, because um, I'm an education major as an international student. Uh, honestly, it's very hard to find a job um, after graduation. Now, people say, oh, you can apply to be a professor. Um, the question would be, um, there are limited seats, I mean, currently at college, Liberal Arts College, a comprehensive university. And the other thing is you're international students. Um, and also, um, it probably, who knows, maybe you don't really like teaching, right? Because I, I don't think I like teaching. So I think the very first thing is that I actually rule out, even though I'm an education major, there are things that I can do. Um, and uh, there are things that I probably don't like. So I rule out everything that I don't think I'm good at it. Actually, uh, graduating from Harvard, quite of my uh, classmates, they do different things. Um, sorry, I have to mention Harvard, not, not UT, but sort of, uh, I think there might be some similar experience that you could, could possibly work on different field. There are some of my classmates actually go to um, a law school and some of them go to Columbia to obtain an MBA. Um, and sometimes go to work for an investment firm um, or like let's say consulting firm. Uh, but I don't think those are for me. Um, I, I really like education, but I don't want to be a professor. So that's a challenge. <laughs> but I was really lucky. As I said, um, all of the pro projects I involved in uh, at UT and also at uh, Harvard, that all combined together to contribute me as an international educator that I know that one, one thing, I want to work at university still. And I work, wanted to work at international education and I enjoy working with students. So that sort of helped me to narrow down. And uh, um, I know this is, uh, the reason that I want to pose this is because social science students, it can be really difficult for one thing as an international fund a job. So that's why I keep mentioning, get your hands dirty, go to do volunteer projects. Then you know what you like, what you don't like, what you can do well, you, what you don't do well. We only have one life. So we wanted to do something that we're really passionate about. Well, that's at least for me. And uh, as international students, we also have to consider about your, our sponsorship. Sorry, I'm going to be very direct here. So you also have to balance that. Would you, you know, get a job first and get your uh, H-1B approved or you go to find a job at a university? I'm lucky that I got a job at a university. That I don't have to worry about my H-1B. Um, but as I said, uh, it's a process. It's probably not going to be that smooth. I, I, I don't want to make assumptions, but I think for social science majors, it can be difficult for international students. So it's probably step by step, but at least you can rule out some of the things that you don't want it to do and always find the balance. What, what is the priority? What's most important? And then at least you don't want it to lose your passion in the process. Um, thank you. Nabu? Yes. So... I don't know if, because uh, I spent, uh, like, growing up, I started in Africa, actually, and throughout the college, you know, my dad, you know, traveled a little bit, and I was, I wouldn't say I was programmed, but I think their intention was for me to get, stay in the medical field, so actually, I started in the medical field, and doing, I was doing okay, but it wasn't my passion. It wasn't something that I wanted to do because, you know, how, how you're in the family and everybody's doing the same thing. So I wanted to really take a different route and growing up, I can feel myself always trying to understand, figure out how things works or trying to be creative, you know, on my own, uh, even trying to think how things work. So that's how I really started to deviate from the standard route that the whole family has taken and I'm going to the engineering. So it wasn't and it was my choice, you know, I said, this is what I was. So when I came to the University of Tennessee, I just signed up to the engineering department and get accepted there. And very much that's how I started my journey. And, you know, I always tell people, it's always easier if you enjoy what you're doing. And I think that was my goal. Uh, I could have been successful in the medical field, but that's not really what I wanted to do, right? It was based on my parents wanted me to do that. So that's just uh, one key point. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And I and I I do echo what everyone is saying here. Pursue your passion. And um, I was also reading a book called Life Design, which says that sometimes you're always looking for that area that you're really passionate about. But and actually, if you ask people, what are you passionate about? Fifty percent of people don't know what they're passionate about. So that's again about trying different things, which is what I did. I was passionate about a lot of things, but I know that wouldn't bring any income in the short run. So <laughs> it's not a realistic thing to pursue as my career. So I think, you know, there's also this balance of a passion and being realistic. Also, like Dr. Huang and Helen mentioned that, you know, uh, being international students at a time where you have to stay legal in the United States. 
So depending on the different majors, you have different lengths of the OPT that you can use. So really plan it out, making sure that we know how long we have the time to search for a job and being realistic. Um, so I did narrow down the fields I wanted to work either and um, actually going back into the journalism fields, doing the broadcasting journalism here in the United States, or I can stay in the higher ed. And I apply jobs to both. And then after getting several rounds of uh, uh, job and interviews and things like that, I also checked the labor department to see whether they're issuing H-1B. I mean, that's one of the qualifiers for me when I was looking for job and narrowing down things just to make sure that they do sponsor international students to work at their organizations. Um, and that actually leads to the next, que next question. What would your job search process like? At least that was my narrowing down. And I remember distinctively that I sent out actually close to 100 um, applications, the resumes before I secure my first job at a university. Um, but that was kind of my process. Anyone else want to share the job search process? I'll oh, just yeah. go for it. Yeah, go, go. sorry, go ahead. <laughs> Mine was uh, actually, I, I took advantage of the UT job fair and all those things. So that's where I really mostly apply. Uh, and when I and also with my internship, so I kind of very much knew my job was secure. They already let me know. The problem is, can you graduate on time to get that position? But technically, I wanted to be somewhere else. So I started searching for jobs. So uh, and going through UT, actually, most of my application started from the job fair at UT. So I didn't do anything beyond. So I, meaning that those job fair at UT, you can take advantage of those also. It's very helpful. Yeah. yeah, one of the best advice I got initially when I first started was to get an internship, you know, similar to um, what you were saying as well. Um, so I got an internship early, multiple internship, I got a job, but then, you know, you still have to ensure that you also apply to for jobs, right? So, you know, the regular application is true indeed, but I did leverage my first job was through career fairs. I think that's really important. And also, um, I've post in my MBA, um, I did get um, jobs from other conferences like the National Black. You know, I knew I wanted to um, move into the tech industry and there were certain companies I was looking for, you know, and like you talked about sponsorship and all that, I knew what I wanted to do. So that was one of the ways I could get to those companies. So um, National Black or um, Nesby or career fairs, you know, that's how most of how I got in front of recruiters that actually helped me land the job I got. Yeah, um, I would love to jump in. Uh, my case is a little bit different. Actually, I didn't spend uh, too much time. I, I would say uh, too much time, but like I didn't too actively seek for opportunity and that's correlated with my um, value of uh, get hands dirty. Um, Cause I got, I did many different projects and the volunteer uh, projects. So uh, I get to know the people and uh, uh, I, I like to listen to people's stories and they actually ask me back about what I wanted to do. Um, sometimes they were offer opportunities um, and they said, oh, would you like to work here, work there? Oh, of course. And then to the end, I didn't select the opportunity that offer they offered to me. I end up with applying the current university, St. Lawrence University, the director of Asia programs position. Um, but I, what I was thinking about this is that I don't think that was that hard back then. Um, actually, that you know, Harry actually offered a position, but it was just one year and then no H one B. So I said, well, I don't want to do it because I mean, unless I wanted to, I, I can think about other ways to get a green card and I can stay there. But no. So at the end, I think that well, for one thing, I really wanted to do what I wanted to do, and the other is that um, I, I think I was pretty lucky that. By continuing working on all these different projects, I get to know people and they share opportunities with us. You know, it's like the reference, you know, people ref refer each other to apply for jobs. Um, so I, I still going back to my very first uh, point is that um, I still encourage that everyone do more projects. I mean, regardless of what it is, and sometimes you probably nobody in the project. That's okay. You do your best and you don't care about what you're going to get. And then get to know the people. I mean, I don't intentionally want to get their attention, but you being being very polite, being very thoughtful, and then you get your experience, you do the work well, and, you know, magic will happen. That's, that's actually something that I believe that people will tell whether you're a reliable person and they would love to chat with you and offer some opportunities to you. Thank you. And kind of to follow up on what Helen was mentioning, that is 
um, I think one thing very important about a job search process is finding your advocates in the areas where you want to do the job search. Um, I have been very intentional about, you know, securing mentors and also fostering mentorship, mentor relationship on campus. So when I was out searching for jobs and I let all of my mentors and my colleagues know that I'm searching for jobs. Um, so then they become my advocate. Also, when they see things coming through, they will send it over to me. And actually my second position, the assistant to the chancellor position was brought to my attention by several colleagues that I worked with before in the College of Communication Information, because that position was not uh, first advertised out. It was first shared with the CCI because they're looking for specific persons, somebody with a PhD in communication. So they, uh, you know, just very um, naturally shared it out with the CCI dean's office. And I also heard it not only from the CCI dean, but also from my mentor, my PhD advisor there to say that, hey, this position is open. I know it's not where you want it to be right now, but you, it, it, you, it's a good fit. So you might want to consider this. That's how I got my second job. So I would say that build up that relationship with your mentor and especially looking in the area where you feel like you wanted to work in to find those mentor very important. Um, anything else people want to share about the uh, job search process? I think that covers it. Yeah. Okay, sounds good. And I know that we have been speaking for quite a bit. I just want to remind everybody in this um, in this group that you can type in any questions as we're talking. If you have questions, type in the chat and um, we will address that along the way. Okay. All right. So uh, what's your what advice do you have for students who want to break into your industry? So I think we are all in different industry um, in higher ads. And Helen, I also want you to mention a little bit about your entrepreneurship background and then that area, yeah. you know, your, your experience in that area as well. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, yep, uh, I'll go first and thank you. So uh, uh, my field is international education. So in terms of how to break in, I would say, uh, first of all, pay attention to all of this um, uh, conferences. The one of the biggest one is the NAFSA. Um, this year is going to be in DC. They have been. I can type in our chat. They keep recruiting um, volunteers every year. Um, I think you know. I don't think it's just this. This international education have this conference, but all other. Yeah. Thank you, Rachel. Uh, some other organizations or field has this like national conferences. I think the very first step is to be a volunteer and to observe and to watch what the people are doing there and uh, talk with the people who are more experienced to ask about this field. And then there are, uh, you know, a list we call a seekers list. Uh, it's like an international educators list of stuff that people ask questions and share job information, share volunteer uh, programs, opportunities. So I think that's the, where you're going to first get started. Um, a lot of people's, well, I mean, especially in my field, um, maybe in the science field is different, but in my field, it's, uh, I would say, if you wanted to be an international educator without any previous experience, it could be really hard. So get some volunteer experience, attend a conference, and then ask, be, be brave to ask for some opportunity to do internship. I remember a few years ago, my office had received an email, a student wanted to, you know, uh, getting a master's degree and wanted to be an intern in our office. Though we never done that before, we still agreed and the student worked here for a month. So I think being a brave, um, you know, like I remember Rachel when she was looking for opportunity, she was very brave to talk with people about what she wants to do, knock the doors. I think it happens in my field as well. Um, I think that's the very first step to break into the field. Yeah. Oh, and also you mentioned about the entrepreneur experience. Well, I will say that when I back, well, uh, that was a project, you know, I think it's all, it was an active uh, student club at UT as well. Um, I was recruited by their um, uh, founder, Holly Chan, in 2013, and I was their community engagement leader advising uh, college students across the United States to build chapters to promote US-China relations. Uh, well, we don't want to get involved into uh, politics, but <laughs> my role was to help 
how we could raise funds and to meet people from different areas and to support this uh, campaign. And uh, I would say I got a lot of uh, practice and I learned a lot, a um, couple of things. Like I do leadership training. I, you know, host sessions around 40 students about how to do leadership, uh, how to build their leaderships. And also we got a chance to meet with, uh, um, uh, well, famous people in this society like Kissinger. And then, uh, you know, I to name a few, the um, U.S. ambassador to China. So we got the chance to see these people. And then to some extent, I realized that they're just like normal people like us. So that kind of helped me to be brave. And uh, and I have uh, this attitude of, of uh, no care. I mean, you know, wh whoever you are, you are a human being, you know, we all agree with each other if we believe the same value. So I think that's a great op a process for me to being a entrepreneur. I think most important is to be brave. And then don't, you know, I, I wouldn't not scare of you just because you're president of certain company or CEO. I, I you're just human being, and I want to hear your story, and I will, want to share with you about my insights. Um, so I think that's important as an entrepreneur. Thank you, Rachel. I think that's what I have for now. Thank you, Helen. Yeah. Do you have any comment on that? How do people uh, break into the industry that you're in right now? So um, just like I mentioned earlier, uh, be curious. For example, in your field, you should be informing yourself and try to understand it. So what I did was I always was into this uh, uh, website talking about engineering, the different aspect of it. But the most important for my case, internship was the biggest thing. I always encourage people to do internship because once you do internship, you can expose yourself and make a decision from there. Do you want to stay in this field or you want to try some? I'm electrical engineering background, but I didn't really work in that field. I was in the manufacturing completely different because I already knew what I was going to do as an electrical engineer, but I didn't know this aspect that I'm doing now. Even though within this group, there's some electrical engineer, but where I started wasn't really related to my field, but it was allowing me to grow that and understand that this is what I really wanted to do with this type of job. Uh, so that's very important to do those internship and participate in job fair. You know, there's a lot of presentation, you know, now we have YouTube back then, YouTube wasn't very popular. So you can teach yourself a lot of things and get informed out there. Thank you. Yeah, for me um, to break into the tech industry is a little bit competitive. But I think the number one thing is um, try to get enough experience first. Like it just depends on what area you're in. Like if you are after your MBA, you're trying to get into a more mid-level career or entry level, I would say, you know, first of all, you know, entry level, you know, you have to try your best to get as high, as much high GPA as possible um, to get into the industry or you know, you can start with a job somewhere else first and get a lot of experience because you want to be a master in your field. You want to get in more experience so you can contribute transferable skills to that industry, right? And that's something we really look for. Now, if it just depends if you are, you know, a software engineer, um, you want to practice a lot, lead code, right? A lot, right? That's something that you want to do constantly. Keep practicing, updating yourself um, with, you know, your coding, you know, being well informed. And then if you want to move to the other side of the business, like, you know, upgrading operations or supply chain or finance, um, I'll strongly advise in addition to your experience, you know, if you can get like an MBA, it does help you to give you an edge over some other people that are going to apply for the same job. So it does help. Thanks. Thank you all. Now I think uh, we should transition to uh, addressing, there are quite a, a, a few interesting questions in the chat. The first one, uh, Natalie's question, who was your mentor at UT? Are you currently mentoring students? Can you get advice on how to approach someone you admire and mentor you? Um, and I would say that my I have a couple mentors at UT. Um, first, my master and also my PhD advisor, Dr. San Fuang, he re, uh, retired and he was also the uh, director for the uh, International Outreach, Global Outreach Program at the College of Communication Information. So uh, very naturally, I gravitated towards who I work with most often as my mentor. So he has been a very strong advocate. Also, through my first job, uh, communications job at the uh, chemistry department, I got to work with the assistant dean at a, a graduate school, so Dr. Ernest Brothers. And I started building relationships through this like a working relationship. And then he became a strong advocate and a mentor for me as well. Also, 
something happens during my um, years at UT. I've been here 16 years and I lost my husband in 2018, December. Um, and then I was attending one of the uh, women's empowerment summits and I met somebody who had a similar experience as I am. And that was the keynote speaker of that summit. And I was, um, um, I showed my vulnerable side and I shared her, my story with her after the meeting. And she has become my, not only my career and professional mentor, but also my personal mentor as well. So kind of like who holds me up when I have all these different things and processing and going through all the different things. So to answer a question about, you know, how to approach somebody who you admire and mentor you, I think it's just finding that personal connection is very important. Like, why do you want to connect with that person? Uh, making that clear and don't be afraid to reach out. Um, I'm currently mentoring students through UT Promise, uh, and I'm also mentoring some of the students who are working in my office right now. So um, that's my two cents. Um, we have a lot of questions, and I wonder if anybody, any other panelists wanted to say something about the mentor question? Uh, yeah, I, I just wanted to edit on what Rachel just said. Yeah, I do have a, quite a bit of a mentor. Um, yeah, I mean, almost like, like at UT, my advisor, Barbara Thayer Bacon, Dr. Barbara Thayer Bacon, and then Marianne Labrine, Dr. Marianne Labrine. And then uh, there's another professor, sorry, I forgot the name, my apologies. But I, I think that it's very important that you get advice from people who are more experienced than you. And sometimes I would say, say it's sometimes like a friendship and you st they started to know you, you start to know them. And don't resist that. I think if people like you and then they appreciate your talents and the skills, then start to talk and meet with them regularly. I think it's really a good way to help us grow. And also um, uh, like uh, not just emotionally support us, but also they will give you advice on careers and uh, opportunity comes in the next corner. So yeah, I just wanted to echo on Rachel's point. Thank you. Yeah, the first person that came to my mind was John Gallagher. He was super helpful while I was doing my um, MBA. So. I usually reach out to him to ask him some questions if I have overall, but you no, know, I just want to echo Rachel's point. Connection is really important, right? Because in the past, I've tried to force mentors, people to mentor me, and we just didn't connect, right? And I noticed that, you know, selecting someone that understands your backgrounds, you know, your struggles, you know, someone that that really gives you that mutual connection, like calls or reaches out to you as well. And abuse that forms that relationship is really important in uh, your mentorship journey. So I'll, I'll encourage that you should find that connection with that person. Abu, you're muted. Yes, you're muted. So I must have been unmuted. <laughs> I mute myself. <laughs> All right. So what I always tell people, you got to go and find, I have several mentors because I was determined to make it on somehow on something. So I had a, my, my number one mentor was my advisor at school. You know, when you new to a school, you always have an advisor, but I, no, I wasn't enough. It wasn't enough for me. So I went and find some different professor. I kind of like always go in there and visit them. I think it's very important. They help you to look at different things and different, uh, uh, area in your life. And during my master degree, I think, uh, my Dr. Cedric, which was the, actually the dean or director of the program, he was my mentor also. That was the hardest one because I was uh, always too relaxed and, you know, not, I think that he really helped me with my life. He told me, tell me truly what I was doing wrong in life and taught me you might be talented, but you, you got some attitude problem that you need to fix. I think that was a wake up call for me. I think sometime during that mentorship, you can learn about yourself and it's going to help you go farther. Okay, thank you. I love that you have a mentor that could be so straightforward with you. <laughs> um, yeah. And we have a, a question I was sent directly to me. I wonder if any of the panelists have um, anybody has ever tried applying for EB1 visa before embarking on the job search process? I have not applied to EB1 visa. Any of you? I, I applied after I, uh, yeah, after I started my job for a while. Okay. Uh, um, that if yes, did you find that companies are more willing to hire candidates with an EB1 over those who needed to file H1B? 
I don't think I have information to answer that because after I see my EDU, uh, my, my green card, is still, I'm still here. I mean, for the past four years. So uh, right, I don't have basis to, yeah. Yeah, so I would say that, uh, um, you know, actually, you know, focus on the job. And that would be my, um, and, and that's something that if, as long as you get an offer of the job, and then that's something that you can worry about later on, but don't limit yourself when you're looking for jobs, just for just thinking about your immigration status, because that's not going to stop you from shining um, what you have ability with. So the next one is, uh, with the current immigration laws, international students aren't allowed to do internships, especially PhD students. How do we navigate this? I think that's more of an immigration question. Um, and I would try to address that a little bit because my colleagues working at International Student Scholar Services, I will highly encourage you to book a immigration advising session with them. Um, since you're at UP, they offer professional immigration advising. Um, it's not true that you cannot do that. There are different ways you can do internships and as an international student. I would drop in the chats, the link to um, for you to book the um, appointment. Okay. How did you manage an internship or full-time job alongside grad school? Anybody want to comment on that? Uh, yeah. And I also noticed a similar question regarding like, uh, I'm a PhD, I'm very busy. How can I find time for volunteer opportunity? Uh, well, let me clarify in terms of a clear, uh, inter sorry, the uh, volunteer opportunity doesn't mean that you have to go somewhere every day. It's probably two hours every week and you probably have to drive like 30 minutes. Um, I was trying to find a link that everyone can take a look. That's NGO positions. Um, bear with me. I'll, I'll come back later for that for that link where you can search for volunteer opportunity. I think the real point for especially for PhD students and also I have to say for our well for our well being. Come on, I mean PhD student can be hard, very difficult. I remember, you know, um, yeah, that was hard. You know what I mean? Anxious and I could not sleep well. But I really think it's a good opportunity for us to go out. It's not like online meeting with people. Um, it would be good to go outside, do something with a group of people coming from different background, talk about our experience and then uh, please find at that time you know like you go to church every uh, Sunday or you know Saturday for Easter but it's, it would be very important that you squeeze that time and you know for social science we read all the time but I just think it's so important that you find a little time every week to talk with people, meet with people, do something that's different. And even in the summertime, um, I actually feel very interesting that we are uh, PhD students not allowed to do internship. I don't think so. So please listen to, uh, you know, Rachel's suggestions. But I do think that, you know, even the summer you're doing internships that you still can find some time during the weekend to do so, something fun. You know, people can, you know, you can go out hiking or do other things, but I really enjoy, you know, there is a, um, what's the thing, what's the term for that? Um, even go to the Goodwill store to help. Um, we, at least here in upstate New York, we always at the uh, Salvation Army, there was always a play there. We need help here. So go there, do something, you know. I think it's an opportunity to change our mind, not only on academics, but also um, talking with people, change our mood a little bit at the same time, creating opportunities for you. Um, so I'm just gonna look up the website and later you can look it up as well. Um, yeah, thank you, Rachel. We'll give that back to you. Anybody else want to say about balancing? Yeah, so I was um, part of Prumber, um, the professional MBA. So I had to do my MBA program and work at the same time. But the good thing is that the program was designed around people that had to work and go full time as well. So mm -hmm. it's it's really challenging, but I'll say this, right? You know, um, feel free to take some time of work, right? You know, to work in your mental well, health, well-being, or, you know, just if you feel burnt out, because there's a lot of projects you have to work on, and there's a lot of weekend work and stuff like that, but, you know, take some time off, you know, if you have, if you feel, you know, probably pretty much exhausted from everything overall. Yeah. Thank you. Yes, so my case, actually, it was hard, because uh, Dr. Cedric, actually, uh, when I finished my bachelor, I didn't want to study anymore. I was so tired. I just wanted to go to work and things like that. But they reached out to me, actually. There was an the electronic side, and they started this new program. So I kept delaying it. And finally, uh, my company allowed me to take it, actually. And they'll say that. Uh, and that's one key point. Uh, I had a flexible schedule. So what happened is if I have the class, I'll have to go to class and come back to work as long as throughout the day I make eight hours. Uh, 
So what happened is if I have class between, so since my company wasn't too far from UT, I was going to UT and attend classes, but I have to stay a little bit longer at work. So that's how I manage my whole uh, master uh, program. And uh, I have to study at night. So when I go home, I'll sleep a little bit and get up. So there wasn't no special treatment because I was dealing, some, most of the students were in class. I was the one that was going in and out uh, or sometimes I'll try to attend uh, back then they used to have something online so they'll record the classes it wasn't live they'll record it and you can go watch it at night so I did that too but uh, you know you just have to be you know dedicated and you have to just you know keep doing but everything is doable I don't want people to think oh how did you manage it and worry about everything is doable it's possible it's feasible so you can do it yeah, I um, I echo that because I also did my PhD program while actually working full time at UT. I started my PhD program and then the second semester into that, I found a full time job working for chemistry. So I negotiated with my department to say that can I work full time but still pursue my PhD degree since I was uh, making enough progress with my study. So they allowed that. So started from the uh, the second semester, I was a full-time staff while obtaining my PhD degree. One thing I would say as a trick that I played is I try to connect my PhD study with whatever that I'm doing. So uh, if I'm doing a class project, if I'm doing a research project or something, I'm, um, I would try to steer that to see if I can combine my PhD study with the job that I'm doing. Can I do a research on student recruitment of underrepresented population? Um, can I, you know, do a communications project that addresses what I'm trying to research? So, so something like that uh, did help me to try to balance that. Um, but at the same time, like Abu said, it's just a lot of sleepless nights. I remember the semester I started doing both of that. I was reading three or four in the morning and I need to get up, go to work again, like seven o'clock in the morning. So, um, but it's, it shall pass is what I'm saying is that. It's a, when you know it's a limited time, a duration, you have to put in the efforts, it shall pass, and then you will survive um, and come out better the other end. So uh, I think it kind of goes into the next question. Um, as an international student in social science, I'm interested in the academic career. As a PhD student, we're expected to do more research and other duties. So making time for volunteer opportunities become difficult. How do I pursue my goal? Like, how do you do all of this research? teaching and all that, but still have time to, I guess, volunteer, build up the network and everything all the panelists have said. Any suggestions? Besides trying to make 48 hours out of a 24 hours day? Sorry, Chu, what was your question? My internet stopped a little bit just now. Oh, okay. So as an international student in social science, I'm interested in the academic career, but as a PhD student, we're expected to do more research and other duties while so making, so making time for volunteering opportunities become difficult. How do I? Oh yeah, okay. Thank you, Rachel. Yeah, I think that's the question I just responded. I said that, well, I'm so sorry. You have to fund like three hours for yourself. Um, I, I just think that it's good for your well-being. It's not fair that you, you just put too much time. I mean, it's important. Research is always important. Future is important. But it is also important for yourself to, for one thing, um, get your hands dirty and uh, talk with the real real world people and uh, talk to people from different backgrounds to do something. Um, so, yeah, I, I'm sorry. I have to push you saying that, well, instead of... Uh, doing all this project in one day, can you talk to your advisor saying, oh, I actually have this volunteer project I want to do. I'm actually just sending over some opportunities like the, uh, did I send the uh, uh, engineer no, without border? It's actually related with engineering that you can volunteer to Africa if you want to. Um, they have different chapters across the United States. If you're an engineering major, I don't know if your boss will be, I mean, supervisor will be happy about it. Maybe your advisor says, oh, that's great things that you can do, you know, helping people, you know. Yeah, so that's my suggestion. I'm sorry that I have to push you to be a little bit, um, you know, squeeze your time. Yeah. Add to what Helen was saying, I would say that if you have limited time, also be very selective of where you volunteer your time. Think about how would you, what are some of the, uh, you know, 
volunteering your time, but how could you maybe combine that with some of the other things that you're already doing? So trying to find time in that way is what I would say that's, you know, um, how to squeeze out that time. Any other suggestions? Um, I would say this, like I'm not, I didn't do PhD, so I'm not best qualified to answer this question, but in general, I will say this, right? One thing I do to balance while I was working and volunteering as well, um, going to school was that while I was working in the companies I've worked for, they have a culture where, you know, we can assign time to volunteer while working during the day, right? So I took advantage of all those opportunities and you know and did to do a bunch of volunteering during that period of time so that helped me balance some of my time overall so if you can find companies that have those cultures you know to really help you you know balance that part of your life academically but also while working full-time as well Apple, do you have any other no, just just to add that i mean i agree with everybody i think it's part of the grow process you know you got to be able to manage your time maximize your time you have only 24 hours right so you got to maximize that time and that's part of the learning process uh, it's another challenging part that if you learn how to overcome that it will help you in the long run because you will never have enough time in a day if you're really doing what you're supposed to do so that's just part of it uh, i think you, it's not easy but it's just a part of growing up and learning what's out there and if I may, I want to recommend a book that I read about time management. It's not really a time management book. It's called Off the Clock. Um, and that was that has really helped me. So what they are doing, what the author did was actually keeping a journal of how she spent her time called Off the Clock. Um, and then by doing that, you actually have a self-reflection of where you are spending time. And you can actually examine if you feel like that's the effective use of your time, um, and I would say that try that. Um, it's uh, it's been it's been working for me because um, I'm juggling a couple of different tasks and things like that. And there's never enough time, but we can find time for things that are important to us. Um, and also, we have another very interesting question: Do you have any advice for someone wanting to move to another country upon graduation who isn't yet completely fluent in that language? And the situation is the student, I'm hoping to move to Spain, but I'm currently at an intermediate level of Spanish. I wonder if my best bet will be to work for an international organization in the US to see if they're looking for someone to go abroad. So this is a very specific question, but I think a lot of us can relate to that question because before we came to United States, we might not have perfect English. So how do we navigate that? Or do you have any advice for somebody who wanting to move to another country, but is yet perfect using that language? Would you recommend to stay in the US, finding an international organization to work and see if they can send, send me abroad, I guess? So, uh, go ahead. The, no, no, I was just clarifying the question. Is, is she asking how you prepare yourself to go or because I didn't leave in Japan that long, but I spent some time there. And uh, how did I prepare myself? Number one, understanding the culture. You got to prepare yourself. You can't go somewhere without doing some study and understanding what you're going to find there. Number two, the language. You got to understand what they speak. You don't have to be proficient about the language, but at least, you know, find something that you can understand. I, I think preparing and adapting to that culture, that's most people, you know, that's the bit most difficult part. Uh, doing the job, I mean, if you didn't know the job, you wouldn't be going there. So that's not, but the understanding their culture is very important because not everybody, you know, have the same culture. Wherever you go, they have some reality, especially when you're inside that country. I, I actually do wanted to respond to this question because two things, two sides. Uh, one is the real world experience and the other is like our experience. I mean, I say me, uh, I don't think my English was as good as Rachel when I first arrived UT. I remember the first class, I can only remember, under, understood two or three sentences. So to be honest with you, that was not fluent at all. But you always learn from practice. Um, well, it depends on what you wanted to do. We came as a student, PhD student, and uh, well, of course we have a teaching job, uh, teaching assistant job, but not to a level that we have to use complicated knowledge to build rockets. 
Um, so that's okay. Uh, but if you wanted to look for a job there, it depends on what kind of job you're looking for. Um, my supervisor, a previous job supervisor, she is actually from Spain and then she leads our Spain program in uh, Malaga in Spain. But she also has a uh, home in Madrid. So her daughter uh, is kind of a half American, half Spanish. And then she went back to um, uh, uh, Madrid to look for jobs. There happened to be a U.S. company that looking for someone who can speak fluent English and uh, kind of a moderate level of Spanish. So she got a really good, good job. So I think the opportunity is there. I think probably my personality is more of a jump in get my hands dirty and see what's going on. I always believe there is opportunities there, especially your, your level, intermediate level. It's not like, you know, elementary level. So it might be better, uh, but I don't know. But in terms of like, uh, you want to work for international organization in the US, um, I do think there are some organizations that especially international education organizations, they have center in Spain. Um, you They probably don't expect you to have a full fluency in Spain, a little bit knowledge of that. That might be opportunity too, but it's probably a, long shot, you probably have to start from very little in order to work for them. Um, but that's just my uh, thoughts. Thank you, Rachel. Yeah. Any other comments? Um, I would like to add that um, for the student who is asking this question to step back and ask yourself, why do you want to work in that country? Is it because you are fascinated by the culture you wanted to visit? Um, or is it because that's, you know, you identify certain area that could only, area of interest of professional interest that could only be in that country. So based on that, I think, you know, you could either find a job that can send you frequently to that place. If your goal for having this job is so you can travel there frequently, or if you are doing something that's just there, like anthropology studies and research and things like that, that needs to happen in the area, then you will need to look for jobs like in that area. So I would definitely step back and ask myself, like, why, why do I want to go to that country? And then depending on the answer to that and trying to find a job that fits my needs. And um, Rachel, let me just add that we have a resource that can help with this research as well in terms of moving to another country, trying to see what's available. So the Career Center, we have something called Inner Stride, and I'll put the link in the chat in a second. But Inner Stride is good for international students looking for opportunities in the United States. So you want to look for companies that sponsor H-1B green card, take CPT, OPT. You can find those. And if you're looking to work or move abroad and you're trying to learn more about the job opportunities, it talks about the websites that has really those jobs and then um, definitely things to explore like outside of the United States. So there are resources that can help you even figure this out or have a better understanding or have do more research before you make a decision because you need information to make a decision. And so that helps you make an informed decision. So I just wanted to add that, but thanks Rachel for all you're doing. <laughs> of course, and okay, since you're back, I'll hand it back to you. I think we address all the questions that's in the chat. Yes, thank you so much, Rachel and everyone for just running with it. My, it's still acting up. My computer, everything Zoom just decided to like, act up and for me it's been that whenever you need it that's the exact time he decides to act up so apologies for that but I know that this has been very very um informative and very very cool so we'll just if there are more questions please feel free to put them in the chat and I will address some of the other questions that we have but um something else that we want to do is feedback so uh, we would like to hear from you and what you're thinking, how this event has been. So if you can take a minute to fill out this form, that would be very helpful. That's for the students that are attending. If you can take a minute to like fill out that form, that would be very helpful. And let me, Rachel, I don't actually know the question where you got, where you all stopped. So also the uh, questions that we haven't answered, I think one thing very um, useful for everybody else to share is what skills do you think that are most important for international students? to develop, to succeed in the U.S. job market? We haven't gotten to that question. Okay, all right, perfect. Yeah, let's address that. So what skills do you think are most important? I think this is, this is a very important question because 
beyond your major, beyond your industry, there are some things that you would probably bring as an international student to the workplace or your employer would require that you have, right? And those are things that you want to be able to address. So what are those skills that you think international students should have in the workplace? And whoever wants to start can jump ahead. I would jump in immediately to say, be a strong advocate for yourself and don't ever um, look down upon yourself or feeling short. Um, I... I always feel like coming from an Asian culture, uh, we're kind of reserved and uh, speak for myself that I, I have, I will be very modest on some of the skills and things that I can do. So, but don't be like that. Um, if you have things to, you know, that can help advance the company or the organizational goal and then how you can contribute, do not sell yourself short. So that's one thing, be your strongest advocate for yourself. And making sure that um, what you do, you also express that and then communicate it well. So um, that's one thing. And secondly is networking. I think one of the things the most important is it doesn't matter where you go, uh, network is important. Networking with the mentors, networking with the coworkers, and also networking outside to the community. So that's very important. And one, uh, uh, one model that I have is bloom where you are planted. That's where I see myself. It's wherever you go, bloom where you're planted. So that's why I carry. Yeah. That's really awesome. I like that. Bloom where you're planted. Yes. Anybody else? I think um, Rachel explained it really, really well. Um, I think it's all about soft skills, right? Do you have the soft skills? You know, can you communicate well? Can you write well, right? Do you have executive presence? And and I just want to touch on a little bit and being an advocate for yourself because um, similar to my culture, we're always heads down on our work. This is what I'm doing instead of, you know, talking about what you do. I realized that, you know, to grow within a company, you know, it's 20 percent how good at what you're doing and it's 80 percent who knows what you're doing. If no one knows what you're doing, it's hard to really grow. So I'll say, and don't be afraid to speak up because I remember when I first started my um, journey, I was worried about a couple of things that, you know, I was afraid to raise up my hand to ask questions or, you know, contribute to, you know, share ideas that I have overall. So I was always quiet, but, you know, I was like, I was just thinking, people care about what I'm saying. What about my accent? Can I really communicate well? But I realized that the more I began to do it, the more comfortable I became doing it. And the more feedback I got that, oh, you know, what you were saying is something that, you know, really is going to drive this within the company. So I said, like, what can your soft skills, what can your executive presence? I think that's really key and important. Yeah, thank you so much, Ifai. I can definitely, definitely relate to that. So I, I was also an international student, but now I work here at UT. And I know that experience of trying to decide, can I speak? Can I actually communicate? Do I even have ideas? Do people care about what I'm saying? But you get to the point where, of course, you were hired for your reason. And so know that and communicate that. And so there's something else I want to just mention quickly is something we call career competences. And I'm putting the, the link in the chat as well. There are tons of links for you all today. But again, the recording will be available so you can always watch it again just to refresh your brain. But um, something called career competences. These are skills. Um, if I knew was talking about the soft skills that employers would really um require any candidates these are things that they cannot train you in and so we call them career competences that employers want to see in a candidate so it's your job to build those competences and to especially communicate those competences in your interview in your job search application materials and all of those things but i just wanted to drop that um, real quick but anybody else um what skills should international students develop um, I actually really want to jump in that, you know, as international students, one of the challenges that, um, as we said, they don't have confidence on our skills, our language. Um, I know sometimes it's, it can be hard, but if you can put some big names on your resume. So one of the things that I did not realize, and actually not that hard, is that the um, uh, UN opportunity, UN volunteer, UN internship. Some people think, oh, United Nations internship. Oh gosh, that's so hard. I, I probably speak on behalf of uh, social science students, but not really. Well, you do have to spend some money on it, you know, for you to 
uh, work at different places in New York City. You have to pay for your uh, summer, you know, housing, that sort of things. But I, I actually think that in the real job market, if you don't have any reference, you don't have networking. I mean, if you have networking, that'd be great. Like people say, oh, hey, just work for us. But you wanted to put big names and also that kind of back up your reference um, words. Oh, they would notice you're going, oh gosh, you work at uh, UN. And then, well, you work at this engineering no border. You as a volunteer to Africa in a summer. So if you may uh, try to put those big names on your resume, um, it will help to some extent, especially when people don't know you too much and when you compete with them uh, within a big pool. Um, I mean, especially for social science students. I think that's very important. Um, I know that, that Rachel has an AP. It's it's amazing. I mean, gosh, when I first, first see a real AP journalist standing in front of me, I was like, oh my gosh, that's a really big deal. So yeah, like I said, try your best to put book big names on your resume. Yeah. Thank you. So let me uh, add to that. Actually, in real life, I, uh, I have engineers from Ethiopia, China, Japan, I mean, all over the globe, Brazil. So one of the things that I've seen most of them struggle with is uh, the soft scale. That's one of them. You know, some countries, when they talk, they yell, right? That's a my ocean country, you know? So some of them, like one guy from Ethiopia, um, his biggest struggle right now is his communication. I mean, he's been in the company, but he always been perceived as uh, confrontational, you know? But that's not the reality, right? So I'm always trying to tell him, you got to adjust the way you talk. And unfortunately, you are in this country. So it's not about this is the way I am. Sometimes you got to work on those soft skills. Uh, my mentor myself was Mike Lay. He's he originally from China. And that was his problem. Uh, he was always yelling when he's talking. And I think uh, he's been in a company for 20 some 30 something years and he was my mentor I always took the time to try to understand what he was saying so I think uh, adapting yourself adjusting yourself is very important as an international student and also observe you know communication is key if you can't communicate and that's where everything starts misunderstanding right Oh, you say this, no, I meant this. So those are things that I will just give advice uh, because I deal with it every day. I mentor a lot of guys from uh, Africa, from different countries. And that's one of the biggest issues of communication, uh, misinterpreting, you know, uh, cons uh, thinking about his mean man this, but he didn't really. So they always tend to read. So you got to watch for that. You're reading the wrong, you know, wrong signal and it takes you to a different level, feeling segregating, feeling this, feeling that. So you have to learn how to you know, those are very important stuff when you get into the field. Most people struggle with that in real life. They end up quitting the job because they have this whole history build up in their head that stopped them from progressing to the next level, right? Thank you. Yeah, thank you all so much. We're, we're coming up to time and this has been very, I even thought we'll finish like in one hour, but the questions kept coming and the answers kept coming. So thank you all so much. Thank you to our panelists. We're really, really grateful that you took out the time to share your story. I know you all are very busy people and this is amazing. I believe that we have all learned a lot. And for everyone here, please do this one thing for us. Fill out the, the feedback form, let us know really um, just provide feedback about this event. And then something else I want you to know is that I believe you can connect with these people after now, right? Is um, is it okay if they connect with you, our panelists? Okay, on LinkedIn or what would be preferred for everyone? What would you prefer? How would you prefer that they connect with you? Hey, LinkedIn is great for me. Okay, LinkedIn, okay. Reach out on LinkedIn, yeah. Okay. LinkedIn's good. Okay. Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, Someone can access the um the form heather um but yes so thank you all so much for um for being here and for listening and for paying so much attention again reach out to them on linkedin because they want to continue this conversation i feel like we didn't even have time to cover everything we did not even finish all of our questions which is very good we will do this again this is the first of many events for international students and people looking to um, work abroad and do all of those things abroad. For those looking to do things abroad, we had a an event where we talked about teaching English abroad as a way to like 
getting to moving abroad. And that is on our website, on our YouTube channel, Teach English Abroad. Um, yeah, I'll put, I'll, we'll send all of those links in a in follow-up email, just so you get the recording and all of this information. But I hope this has been helpful for everybody. I truly hope it has been. Thank you all so much for joining us. And this is where we bring it to an end. Thank you all so much for joining. Fill out the feedback form. That will be helpful. Thank you, our panelists. Have the best and most amazing day. Thank Everybody. you. Have a great day. Yes. Thank you. Mm -hmm.